Shia Muslim community of Dearborn started before year 1900. There were some individuals who traveled from the Middle East, from Lebanon, coming to Michigan, to uh, Detroit area and Dearborn area, searching for work. Some of them arrived as early as 1875. My grandfather uh, came in 1885, which is why the family's been here over 135 years, and they came for economic opportunity, but then they also wanted their children to be born here in the United States and have that opportunity to have citizenship in this country. So our grandmothers would make the long call, the kids would be delivered here in the Detroit area, and then they would be raised back in Lebanon and when they were teenagers, they would come back, being fully American citizens, and also to get education. Ford Motor Company started offering $5 a day. So a lot of the Arabs who were living in Michigan City moved to Dearborn, Michigan, and worked at the Ford Motor Company. They would leave the foundry, and they would be covered with dirt, and all the uh, men would come home, take a bath, get dressed up in their suit, put a white shirt on, put a tie, and they would go on Dix Avenue. And all the men would congregate outside of the coffee houses and the other businesses and trade stories. He was a cowboy out in the West trying to make money and work on the railroad. And then when uh, Ford Motor Company was paying $5 a day, which was, I guess, big money back then, then, then he started working at Ford Motor Company. Well, when they moved to Detroit and the Depression started, she would tell us stories about how that affected their life. She would shop and start saving sugar, flour, butter, whatever. And then when the Depression started, and there wasn't much of that, you know, everything was rationed, I think. Um, Alhamdulillah. She had a lot, you know. I got to tell you, whenever I think of my mother and how hard she worked, it breaks my heart. Everybody else, um, my, my grandfather, great man, he was a sheep herder in, in Bintish Bel, Lebanon, and he came uh, to this country looking, looking for a future. We had the automotive company, Henry Ford, that was starting out uh, their business here, and, and uh, that's where people were coming to get jobs. And so he came in the early 1900s, and my dad was born, uh, Hajim Muhammad Turfi, well, he was born in 1931, and he was born here. About probably in 1932, 33, they all moved back to Lebanon. My father did uh, come back and, 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 and uh, he had some resistance. My, uh, my grandparents uh, did, not, uh, did not want him to come. And so he, uh, he got up on, they had a little a building in, in Vintage Bell and he got up on the balcony and, and he threatened to jump if my grandmother wouldn't let him come. You know, she was the main resistance. And uh, finally they succeeded, they succeeded to him and, uh, and then he came, he came came to this country. Henry Ford had opened up the uh, big, huge uh, Rouge complex and was employing people literally from all over the world. Arabs, Lebanese mainly, uh, that could get uh, to this part of uh, America found it fairly easy to get a good job at the Ford Motor Company because Henry Ford was paying $5 a day. Back in the uh, you know, middle, uh, late 20s, that was a pretty decent wage. You could support a family, certainly. You could buy a house. You could even afford to buy one of Henry Ford's cars. During the Depression, they were, again, extremely poor, and they had so many children to feed. And at 12 years of age, um, my uncle Mike, my grandfather, asked him to send a letter to President Roosevelt, because they laid my uh, grandfather off. He had no job and no way to feed his children. So my Uncle Mike, at age 12, wrote a letter to the President of the United States. 
The President of the United States read it and responded. My grandfather was able to get his job back. This is from the World War II Memorial and the Gold Star, the Bronze Star, the Silver Star that uh, my father received for meritorious and heroic action. And it tells you all the places where he was, Normandy, Northern France, Ardennes. When we'd go to bed in the evening, she'd read out of the Quran for us everything about the Hassan, the Hussain, Muhammad. People from the neighborhood would come and she'd teach them about the Quran and she'd make fields out of the Quran. And actually, it wasn't a lot of people, but it was a small community and they were all close and they were all very religious. The Arabs in South Dearborn were kind of looked upon, and a lot of people don't like me to say this, but it was kind of looked upon like the blacks are looked on in many communities. I can remember my brother telling me that something was stolen in high school and the only lockers they opened up was the Arabic kids lockers and they never stole anything. We never locked the door in South Dearborn, nobody ever stole from each other. It was, had a reputation for being a rough neighborhood because we all stuck together. If someone was bothering you, you, all you had to do is say, look, I'm from South Dearborn, and they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for bothering you, because they all stuck together. They were always preaching religion. We always used to go to uh, Sunday school on Sunday, although Friday was our, our Friday prayers, but because people worked and stuff like that, we, did, we, we conducted that services on Sunday as well. Well, they all covered their hair, even the Catholics, which they were. <laughs> the, the Ukrainians were Orthodox, the Spaniards were Catholics, and my great-grandmother was a Muslim, and they all covered their hair. It was hard to tell who was who. That was a very, very interesting time because every neighbor was like a a, a parent to you. You could knock on any door. You were safe. The kids played safely in the parks. Lila, Yvonne, Andre, Faye, Jerry, Wanda, and David. I asked my dad, I says, Dad, I says, why? And all our middle names are traditional Lebanese names. Uh, I asked him, well, he says, you know, Dad, I didn't want you guys to have the same problems and trials and tribulations as I did as my name because his name was Muhammad. The early uh, travelers or the early immigrants, they were more culturally um, inclined, I would say, rather than Islamically inclined. But then there were a few who were kind of, I would say, the seeds, those who rooted this community. And they would hold things in their homes. They began to hold Friday prayer in their homes and, and you know, began to help one another out and to be able to galvanize an Islamic identity. The early Shia who migrated to this country, they might have been practicing Muslims themselves, but over years and over lack of religious leadership and religious guidance, their Islamic identity was deteriorating and fading away, basically. And their children and their grandchildren were being raised in an environment where there was hardly any uh, religious upbringing and any religious teachings. They basically had their identity dissolved in this uh, country. Uh, many of, of them uh, converted to Christianity. Uh, some of them did not l technically convert to Christianity but their religious identity was completely diluted. Their only connection to Islam was probably the two Eid, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, not even Ashura, not even the month of Ramadan itself. I believe this is something inevitable that would happen when there is no religious, enough religious guidance. But what was beginning to happen is when the early immigrants came, they adopted Christian ways and Christian identities in order to understand their Islam. So our funerals had a Christian-like style. Our wedding ceremonies had a Christian-like style. And that's because the first generation of American-born Lebanese Shias were starting to be, you know, in their 
18, 19, 20s. They brought the Christian traditions into our mosques. The idea of passing a basket doesn't probably happen in many places in any Islamic country, but it was happening in our community and became almost an iconic thing to pass the basket. Well, where'd that come from? That came from the church. Funerals. Caskets were open, not closed. Caffins were not closed. They were open. There was three-day, four-day funerals so that people could come and have these rituals that Christians had. So we kind of went through this evolution of Islamic identity, and it wasn't until I was well into my 30s. I remember exactly, probably about 36, before I really myself understood the core Shia identity. A pious sheikh with limited uh, Islamic education, but with extreme devotion and piety. His name is Sheikh Khalil Bazzi. Sheikh Khalil Bazzi served in uh, Detroit metro community in the uh, early uh, 1920 and 1930. And in fact, at that time, he was the only religious figure living among the Muslim community. The man would not charge any fees for any of the services he would offer. When a few members of the community wanted to honor this man, they went and they bought him a new car. And the man refused. When he came home and his wife told him about the new car, he told his wife that she needed to call those people who brought the car, otherwise he would divorce her. And she had to call those donors uh, and ask them to come and take the car back. Sheikh Khalil Bazzi also had wikala, representation from a few maraja of the time, such as Ayatollah Sayyid al-Hakim and uh, other uh, grand Ayatollahs in Najaf. He worked a vegetable and fruit truck that he drove around into neighborhoods. And he did that during the day. And then when there was a funeral or a religious service or a marriage, including my own, um, you know, he would put his cloak on and he would put his turban on and he would become the imam. The community decided to basically gather at a place where they can basically meet on a weekly basis, have some religious uh, events celebrated, and so on and so forth. They chose a place known as the Hashemite Hall. Hashmi Society was a uh, building on the corner of Dix Avenue and Salina. It was originally a bank. The Hashmi Society were a group of um, Shia Muslim men who got together and bought the building. Initially, they bought it to rent it out as a uh, hall. Weddings were performed there, funerals were performed there. It was just a big hall, but downstairs they used it for events, whether it was a wedding, a dinner, and upstairs was Sunday school. It was packed with all the people from the neighborhood. That's where the religion sprouted from. It wasn't, it wasn't immaculate, it was just like a, just a little, little hall. But people went there to practice their faith. If we didn't have that place, who knows where we would have been. So it was their, it was their meeting place, it was their salvation, it was, you know, it, was their, it was their meditation place, it was the place to meet you know, the rest of the Muslims. It gave people a sense of pride as well too and, 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 and allowed them to practice their faith so they didn't lose their faith. I used to go to the Hajmi Hall also for Sunday school and to learn Arabic because my mother was uh, American. She was from uh, Ada, Oklahoma. So every Sunday we would go to Sunday school and uh, every Sunday I would learn a left bit and, and my Arabic isn't that good but I still remember from when I was five years old uh, learning that. It was a family. We knew everyone. The women would work. They'd get up at like three, four in the morning to come to the mosque to make bahat, to make the bread, to make uh, the cookies, the kahak. So 
The women were extremely cohesive. At one time, my aunt was the president of the women's club. In my early adulthood, I had to make a decision. I felt, thinking in my mind, having a psychological dilemma. Am I Muslim? I know I'm Muslim. Am I Arab? Yeah, Arab descent. Am I American? Yeah, you're born in America. Your parents and grandparents, you know, all citizens. Well, what am I really? And so then I made the decision I could choose. I didn't have to give up one. I could choose the best of each of these, and that's what I did. People didn't even know where the Middle East was back then. People didn't even know what is Islam. They would ask, what is, what is Islam? Where is the Middle East? How do you worship? What do you do? We had the riots uh, in 1969. I started to get acclimated to, to discrimination understanding it like I didn't really understand it because you're black that means you, ha you should be discriminated against we never understood that and so but then I started understanding it as it as an Arab as an Arab American American Arab you know I started understanding how how when, when, when my mother would wear the hijab and people would look at her funny and, and, and I never could understand it you know she, she, she uh, you know, she was just as American as, any, as anybody else. We as Arabs ran into problems because we were Arabs, certainly. We didn't blend in as easily as the other kids that came from the South End who were Christians and white. Uh, so yeah, you know, we were called the names, camel jockey, sand ends, and so on and so forth. Vietnam is the scene of a powerful aggression that is spurred by an appetite for conquest. It is the arena where communist expansionism is most aggressively at work in the world today. I actually got drafted, that was during uh, the Vietnam War. They asked me what my religion was. I told them Islam, the guy had never heard of it that was doing it, so he put down none. I got sent to Vietnam in 1967. I was in a helicopter gunship platoon, it's called. Uh, I was a door gunner, which means you kind of just sit in the door of a helicopter and people shoot at you and you shoot back at them. Mm -hmm. I did that for uh, about nine months. When I left, uh, my mom gave me a, a small Quran to wear. I never took it off the whole time I was there. And many, many is the time I ended up yeah, in a foxhole when we were being mortared or they were shooting at us, praying to Allah to keep me from harm. And my prayers were answered. Seeing the injustice that I saw there in Vietnam um, changed my outlook about humanity. Um, I saw how we mistreated people, uh, unreasonably so. I was just a very, very small cog uh, in the wheel there without any influence and couldn't really say anything, but... Uh, the longer you're here, the more you're, you're able to claim an identity. That's just one of the things that freedom of religion allows you to do in this country. So as they had fallouts over ideological or theological issues, we began to see the splinter into the community, which then gave birth to the religious identity and mosques of Shia Islam that we see today. There were some sectarian uh, divisions among the early immigrants that led to the uh, basically movement to be split up. That was the first move uh, for uh, many to think uh, on the long term for having a permanent place and that was a dream that was realized afterward under the shape of the Islamic Center of Detroit or Islamic Center of America. The Muslim families, they were trying to save money 
to get a piece of land and build a mosque. So each family donated $5. That's how poor they were. They could only afford $5. One man put a lien on his home so they could build a mosque. So that mosque still stands, the building stands. And uh, that was called the Islamic Center of America. My father and, and all the aforementioned individuals and other individuals, um, they mortgaged their homes uh, to buy some land on Joy Road in, in Detroit. And they purchased this property, uh, the Islamic Center of, uh, of Detroit, as it originally was, it was called. People were struggling, you know, they worked hard. So as our gift to the mosque, we painted the whole mosque. It was, it was a big job. Sheikh Mohammed Jawad Shiri was a well-educated cleric who uh, studied in and graduated from the Najaf Seminary. And through his dedication and his tireless efforts, he was able to mobilize the community so they can have their own first mosque and center. He solicited some help from abroad, mainly from Egypt, from the Egyptian president, Jamal Abdel Nasser. Jamal Abdel Nasser, who was aspiring to be a nationalistic leader for all Arabs, was probably thinking at that time to unify Shia and Sunni Arabs under one banner, under the pan-Arabism. Upon meeting Imam Sheikh Mohammed Jawad Shirri in Cairo, he decided to donate toward the very first Shia uh, center in Detroit. He did actually donate uh, around 80,000 US dollars. From there, the journey, the real journey of Shia Islam in America started from the Islamic Center of America, which is considered the mother center of most of the Islamic centers uh, Shia Islamic centers and also I can say maybe this is one of the most important Islamic centers whether it is Shias or Sunnis. With the blessings of God and their hard work they sacrificed honestly, they sacrificed raising their children, they sacrificed their careers and from there and from the Islamic Center of Detroit it spread and it, it founded who we are today. Just having a facility that was a mosque and a community center together that had a real prayer room. You can open the doors and go into a domed area. I mean, these symbols of religious identity, they grew in us and, and we understood that we counted. There are so many great men that sacrificed everything for the sake of Islam and for this community. We wouldn't be interviewing right now, but for those great men. Today, the number of Muslims in Detroit is estimated to be around 300,000, from which I can safely say there are at least between 60 to 80,000 Shia Muslims. Somehow when you get large, you lose the intimacy. And the intimacy was what made all of us cohesive and we, we truly loved each other. So, I mean, we still have that love, but we don't know a lot of the people. Dearborn has an election coming up, and it looks like Dearborn is probably going to elect its first Arab American uh, mayor. I know it's something that uh, my parents would probably never have uh, dreamt that ever would uh, have happened. We don't propagate from the pulpit, we propagate from the street by opening doors, by saying thank you, by saying hello, by saying goodbye, you know, by doing these little things that don't cost us a penny. That's how you propagate Islam.